everybody. Uh, I am here today in Rachel's room. Uh, I think I'm going to try to, for all these videos, just kind of move around the house, maybe do some outside, just to mix it up. Um, but, uh, so you know I'm not lying, um, you can see uh, her room here. Um, cute little cat calendar. Uh, not sure why we still have that poster. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can see she's got Moana sheets. This is my favorite thing in the house, in her room. You're welcome. Anyway. Uh, so what we're going to try to do on Sunday mornings, you know, we sent out material last week and I'm not sure how many of you guys actually did anything with it, but what I wanted to do this week, uh, start something new. We're going to do a video. We're going to continue through the series that we've been doing, the foundations of the faith series, um, on Sunday mornings, uh, just to give you guys some basics, because honestly, right now, as things are really kind of chaotic and crazy, you can really be spending this time focusing on your relationship with Christ if you have the tools to do so. So I want to make sure that you guys know kind of what to do, how to do that, how to make that work for you. And so we're going to continue through our series. You know, we've been talking through some basic stuff that we need to do. And today we're going to uh, talk about something that's not super fun, but it is something that we need to know how to deal with. We're talking about how to deal with sin today. Um, and so <clears throat> I want to go ahead and tell you my notes are like right here, like right beside me. So if you catch me doing this, I'm looking at my notes. Don't, uh, don't panic. All right. First off, first thing we need to talk about when we talk about sin, we have to recognize the fact that we all have it, all right? Everybody has sin. Romans 3.23, we know, says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, um, you know, Romans 6, 23, we know that the wages of sin is death. So we know there's, that it's a big deal. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about how big a deal sin is, but we know that like, that's, that's a fact that is not new to you. That's something you've known probably for quite a while. But if you don't, the basic idea is this, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We do things we shouldn't do. And God is perfect, and so that's kind of a big deal. And I'm, I'm sorry the camera's a little bumpy here, but um, that's just how it is. So anyway, the fact is, like, each of us is sinful. Each of us struggles with sin. It's real in our lives, and so we have to figure out how to deal with it because that sin makes our relationship with God just off. Thankfully, Scripture lines out for us pretty clearly what we need to do, how we need to handle sin, um, and, you know, what God desires for us when it comes to the, uh, the idea of sin. So let's talk a little bit about that. All right, first off, First uh, John 1, 9, which is a verse I'm going to have you guys look up a little bit later. Uh, it talks about the fact that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That the act of confession helps us line our lives up the right way with God. Now, don't misunderstand. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but the act of confessing sin is not what forgives sin. God forgives sin. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is what forgives our sin if we placed our faith and our hope in him and our trust in him. So understand that it's not an action of ours that forgives our sin. It's an action of God. That's really important for us to start there. So when we talk about confessing sin, when we talk about dealing, sorry, when we talk about dealing with sin, we're really talking about the, the process of repentance. And repentance is a big word that means a, a lot of different things, but the, the basic idea of repentance is that we are turning from our sin and pursuing something new. We're pursuing what God has for us. Turn away from sin turn towards God and pursue him and the life that he has for us. So when we talk about repentance, there's a process there that we go through. And this is ultimately how we deal with sin. And this is what I want you guys to learn on how to deal with sin in your own life. Okay, here we go. It's very simple. There's three steps. Three steps. There we go. Um, those steps are uh, all based on the word call. C-A-L, call. Um, that was two L's. I, I, I know my my words. Anyway, three calls of repentance. Number one, anytime you have sin in your life, the first step to dealing with it is that you have to actually admit that it's sin. You have to call it sin. 
if you have something in your life that you're struggling with and you think, well, it's not a big deal, it's not a, not a major problem, that's a major problem. You know, sin is huge. And so if we're lying to our parents, it may not seem like a big deal. Maybe we didn't get in much trouble. But the truth of the matter is, anytime we sin, it really messes up our relationship with God. It gets things all muddied up. And it messes up our relationship with other people, too. So the first step to dealing with sin is calling what you're doing sin. If it's wrong, if it's against what God desires for you, if it's against what Scripture says you should be doing, it's sin. So you have to first be able to say, what I'm doing is not right. It's not pleasing to God. It's messing up my relationship with God. It is sin. So first step, call it sin. Number two, you have to call it forgiven. Now, this is a really tough one. This one's actually harder than calling something sin. It's easy for us, a lot of times, if you're a follower of Christ, to say, man, I'm just awful. I'm terrible. I've messed up. I've done things that God does not want me to do. My life is a mess. It's a lot harder for us to get to the point where we say, but I know that Jesus has forgiven me. And the truth of the matter is, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, your sin is already forgiven, guys. It's forgiven. It's not based on you or anything you've done. It's based on him and what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So how many times do we spend hours or days or weeks or even months just moping around in our sin thinking of how terrible we are when the truth is God doesn't view us that way? Now, God hates our sin. Don't misunderstand that. But when God looks at you, if you're a follower of Christ, he sees Jesus your sins are forgiven through Jesus. It's already taken away. And so the one thing, I tell people this a lot, you know, Satan wants to do two things in the world. People give him a lot of credit, but he only has two goals. Number one, he wants to, uh, to keep people from coming to Christ. And so he's going to try to keep Christians from telling people about Jesus. Second thing he wants to do is he wants to keep Christians who, who you know, have a relationship with him from doing anything. Like he wants you to be down in your sin. He wants you to be down in despair and temptation and frustration and all those things because then you're ineffective. You're not growing in your relationship with Christ when you're bogged down with sin. You're certainly not telling other people about Jesus. You're not going to be as obedient to God and the, the calling he's placed on your life. So that's what Satan wants to do. And I'm just kind of in the business of saying, you know, I don't want Satan to get anything out of me. I don't want him to win in any way, shape, or form. And obviously, we know ultimately God gets the victory over everything. But on an individual basis, do you want to give Satan any type of victory in your life? I say no. So one of the best ways to do that is to understand that your sin is forgiven through Jesus Christ. And that should give you encouragement this morning. Your sin is forgiven. Claim that. Call your sin forgiven. Call it sin. Call it forgiven. And then finally, the last one is the, the one that we really need to make sure we try to focus on when we talk about repentance. We need to call on God to change us. Now, this requires a change of behavior. It requires us to be willing to try things differently than we've been doing them. It may require us to change some relationships in our lives. It may require us to change some habits and some activities and places where we spend time. But ultimately, it, it really requires us to look at God and say, God, I don't want to be the way I am. I don't want to struggle with this anymore. I want to move forward and then allow God to help you get there. And he wants to. So understand that we call, uh, call it sin. Anything in our life that is sin, we call it sin. We have to admit that it's wrong. We have to be willing to change it. Number two, we have to call it forgiven and appreciate the fact that God has done this through Jesus. And then number three, we need to call on God to change us. Ask him to make us better. Ask him to make us different. That's kind of what he likes to do. So, here's the, the thing. Two points with this. When we talk about repentance, 
we have to realize that confession without recognizing the forgiveness that comes through Jesus, that lacks admission of where God is. It lacks a recognition of where God actually is in our lives. Like if we say we have sinned, but we don't accept the fact that Jesus forgives us, then we're kind of limiting who Jesus is and what he does. And that's not good. But on the flip side of things, if we confess and recognize forgiveness, but we don't have a desire to actually see things change in our lives, then we're setting ourselves up for continued failure and struggle. And so it's important when we prepare to confess and repent sin that we genuinely want to change. If you don't, there's no real repentance in your heart. See, these are activities we do with our minds and with our words, but ultimately they all start with our heart. If our heart's not there, then it doesn't really matter what our actions bring. So, I want to remind you one other time. Understand that the confession itself is not what forgives you. So you don't have to word things perfectly. You don't have to get it right every time. Confession is not what forgives you. It is the grace of God. It is the blood of Jesus that forgives you for your sins. It's already forgiven. You may ask the question that we would all logically ask, then why do I have to confess? Why is that a big deal? Why am I told to do that in Scripture? Well, because, quite simply... When we don't confess our sin, our relationship with God is not in the right order. We are running our lives. We're in control of our lives. And that's not how it's supposed to be. So repentance is important. Confession is important because it gets our priorities straight. It gets our, our relationship line the way it should be. Now, one other thing. Um, how do we do this? <laughs> like, How do we deal with sin on a regular basis? I've got a few things to, to tell you here, okay? Number one, one of the best things that you can do, and this is really helpful, is on a weekly basis, ask God what sins you have and then confess them. God will reveal to you what sins you have. So ask him. Say, God, what am I struggling with? I may not know. Like, I may not know what I'm dealing with, but God does, and he wants you to confess it. He wants you to move on and admit to him that you're a sinner, that you've sinned in this way, and then let him forgive you and move on in your life, Okay. That's the first thing you can do. Second thing you can do, I think, is just as helpful. Um, write down your struggles. Write down the things that you know you're struggling with. If you don't have a journal, get a journal. Right? It's not a diary, unless you're a girl, it could be a diary. But it's not a diary, it's a journal. It's a journal of what's going on in your life, what's going on in your heart. And I can tell you from personal experience, to be able to look back on your life and your old journal entries is one of the most meaningful and impacting things you'll ever experience. So... Write down your struggles and then, sorry, I'm recording this at noon on Friday and so the alarms just went off for the, you know, test for the uh, uh, storm things. So, yay. Anyway, so if you hear weird noises, it's not my stomach, that's uh, alarms. But um, anyway, the fact is, uh, if you'll write down your sins and write down your struggles, then you can also recognize where God forgives you. You can see it. You can work through it uh, piece by piece and see how God's working. Um, you can even turn it into prayer requests. Uh, another big one, and this is a huge one. We all need this. You need to find an accountability partner. You need to find somebody that you trust who's willing to ask you difficult questions about your life and about your struggles and about your temptations. Ideally, this is going to be somebody who's not struggling with the same stuff that you're struggling with because, let's be honest, when somebody else is struggling with what we're struggling with, we tend to let each other off the hook a little bit so that we don't feel bad about our own sin. Um, you also need to, uh, to make sure that this person is not of the same, or that the person is of the same gender, okay? Uh, you don't really need to have a dating relationship where you are telling them your struggles in your dating relationship, okay? So um, you want this person to be somebody that's going to be there for you, that you can count on, and this will create some of the strongest relationships and friendships you'll ever have in your life. So get an accountability partner, which obviously right now is not going to be super easy. I understand that. But you can still FaceTime. You can still call each other. You can still text. Uh, you just need people who care about you enough to hold you accountable and keep you in line. Finally, I would encourage you to find verses that deal with whatever it is you're struggling with. 
Um, find those verses, think about those verses, and uh, try to memorize them. Try to make them a, uh, a regular part of your life. When you're struggling, think them. All right, meditate on them. Focus on those verses of Scripture. Now, for your lesson today, what I'm going to have you guys do, and this is the big difference from last week, because I know we, we had printed material last week, and again, I don't know how many of you guys actually accessed that stuff, but uh, today's is going to be a little easier, and this is kind of the format we'll start using. I want you to read two places in Scripture. Number one, I want you to read the verse in 1 John 1, 9, that we've already talked about a couple of times, we've already quoted it for you, but I want you to look it up, read it, Try to memorize that verse. If you don't already know that verse of Scripture, try to memorize that verse of Scripture. Number two, I want you to read Psalm 51. Now, those of you that know Psalm 51 know what it's about. Uh, those of you that don't, I'm going to tell you. All right? So Psalm 51 is basically this. All right? King David, uh, you know David and Goliath, he becomes king. And uh, when he's the king... He is supposed to be out one day with his soldiers out at the battlefront, but he decides to stay home. While he's at home, if you don't, again, you probably know this story, but I'll just give you the quick version. While he's at home, he sees this beautiful woman out across the way on her balcony bathing. Um, yeah, we don't do that today. Nobody bathes out on their balconies, um, I hope. But anyway... Um, so she's out there, and she's beautiful, and he wants her. He wants her to be his, and so he, he you know, is the king, so he can make that happen. He brings her over to his place, um, and he sleeps with her, okay? He has sex with her, and um, when he's done, when they, you know, a, a little while later, he finds out that she's pregnant, and in order to try to fix the situation and make sure he doesn't get in trouble, uh, he brings her husband back from the battlefield and uh, tries to get him to sleep with his wife. Um, to sleep with Bathsheba. And uh, he won't do it, he won't do it, he won't do it. Um, and so, you know, David is stressed, he's frustrated, he doesn't know how to fix the situation, and so he decides to fix it by having uh, this man, Uriah, killed in uh, battle. He has him, uh, you know, kind of tricks the, tricks the guy into moving forward when everybody else in the line moves backward, and he's, he's killed. And so... Um, Psalm 51 is not that story. Psalm 51 is right after a guy named Nathan, who's a prophet, comes to him, comes to King David, and tells him that everything he's been doing has been sinful. He's holding him accountable. And, uh, and David finally recognizes his sin, and he stresses out about it, and he's, he's heartbroken over it, um, and uh, just in complete grief mode, just awful. And Psalm 51 shows us the heart and mind that we should have when we confess sin. We should be brokenhearted over our sin when we struggle. And so he lays out for us pretty clearly. It gives you a good idea of what it should look like truly in our hearts whenever we confess and repent sin or repent of sin. So those are the things I want you to read. And then when you're done with that, I want you to do me one more favor. I want you to get a piece of paper. And I would just want you to start writing down the sins that you know you're struggling with right now. I want you to write those things down, and uh, then I want you to pray them. I just want you to pray through those sins. And if you're ready to really confess and move on from those sins, then I want you to look at them. I want you to call them sin. I want you to call them forgiven. I want you to call on God to change you. All right, that's your lesson for this week. I hope you guys are doing great. I love you. I miss you. And uh, I will see you soon, I hope. See you guys.